you to everyone who made this possible um, and for Ashley. I'm really excited to be here uh, for the weekend. San Francisco is one of my favorite places, so whenever I can find a reason to come and visit, I always do. So part of the reason why I opted to uh, present at this altar conf versus the one in Minneapolis, which is where I came in from. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, as you can see, my name is Caroline, and I'm a freelance web developer and designer. I also work with uh, companies to uh, put together initiatives around social responsibility, um, culture, and inclusion programs as well. And today I'll be talking a little bit about code switching. Oh, great. Um, so, I'm going to start off with a quick story. This is kind of going to be a mesh of stories and then some how-tos or ideas behind what I'll be talking about. Um, so, uh, yeah, so a few years ago in college, I was hanging out with some friends and my mom called me. Uh, I don't usually talk on the phone when I'm hanging out with people. It's just a, a thing I don't do. Uh, but I really missed home at the time, so I decided to step aside and say hi. So she's one of those people who's incredibly talkative and always knows how to get me going and sort of like just keep me on the phone for as long as possible. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, we were on the phone for a while and eventually we said our goodbyes and I went back to my friends. Um, and one of them said, well, I didn't realize he had such a thick accent. And I said, no, I don't. And she said, yes, you do. What language are you speaking? And I, you know, I didn't quite understand what it is that she was saying because I didn't realize that all of a sudden I was talking differently and speaking a different language and I was speaking to my mom. Um, but the phrase was really more out of curiosity than anything else. So before this moment, I didn't realize that I had never actually spoken to my parents on the phone in public. And part of that was just because it, it's just not really part of me to speak on the phone when I'm in public. Um, but either way, I learned at a very, very young age how to speak English, and not just any English, but a really specific Midwestern dialect um, because I was raised in Madison, Wisconsin for part of my life. And even though I didn't realize it, what I was doing is something that's called code switching. So I didn't realize that I, was, that I spoke differently or that I spoke in a different language. And um, so this, this term on code switching is specifically used with linguistics. But within my circle of family and friends, I always kind of spoke, I guess, this mesh of like Swahili and English with a little bit of Kikuyu, which is um, my mother tongue. And, um, you know, once in a while my accent would slip out, and I'm sure some of you can identify with this, I would always just like chase after it and pull it back in uh, <laughs> and, and to try my best to sort of be wherever I, I, I am in that moment. And it became a part of the way that I speak every day. So this is just me speaking normally, the same way that being on the phone with my mom, you know, 10 minutes ago is also me just speaking normally. Code switching is when a speaker alternates between two or more languages or language variants, and multilinguals um, in particular speak, when they're speaking more than one language, use elements from all these different languages together. And sometimes it's about changing the language, it's about changing how you speak, sometimes it's about changing the cadence or the dialects or the specific word choices that you're putting together. In many ways, it's really none other than conversational assimilation, right? So, but there's like a specific way that I in particular express um, myself in that mix that I can't quite while speaking English or Swahili. From my lens, this multilingual experience allows me to appreciate the complexity and the fluidity of language, identity, and expression. Um, and in many ways, you know, because I'm a huge Beyonce fan. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's the art of making lemon, lemonade, um, making lemon into lemonade. And people from different cultures have been doing it for a while. It allows one to keep their cultural identity while adapting to new spaces and taking on societal markers that signify different things, such as acceptance or um, sort of like ideas of the norm, whatever that may be in the spaces that we're in. In a different context, code switching is an effort to assimilate to the surrounding environment. Sometimes unconsciously, sometimes intentionally, it's always, um, it's in part an effort to fit in. But why does this happen? 
that in itself is a really complicated question. Identity is complicated. Um, from my lens, code switching has allowed many people to survive. It's not a bad thing. It allows you to break through where you might otherwise just break. Additionally, it's a space between borders that can craft innovation and creation uh, that wasn't possible on either side. But let's go bigger, beyond linguistics. Let's talk about code switching in the work environment. Um, and so there, there are ways in which this becomes really, really dangerous. When intentionally altering one's behavior and personality is the only way that individuals can succeed in an organization, then we have a problem. Uh, this kind of assimilation is a result of toxic environments um, that breed exclusionary practices and uh, homogenous thinking. Which if you're a business person, you know, homogenous thinking is really bad for your bottom line as well. But what would this look like for those of you who don't code switch or don't really realize that you're code switching? Um, I was trying to think of a good analogy around this and I thought how many times I unlock my phone and I do those finger swipe thing. Um, mine is very, very easy to figure out. My three-year-old nephew uh, did it in like two seconds, which made me very sad. <laughs> Um, but imagine you had to put in a randomized alphanumeric phrase every time you were to unlock your phone. So think about how many times you check it, you check your email, you respond to text, post on Instagram or Snapchat. Um, if every single time you had to do that, you had to look at a sheet of paper and type that in and then do whatever task it is that you were meant to do. That would get really, really annoying. It would be a really unpleasant experience. And even if you got used to it, it still would kind of hinder your process. It would hinder your ability to, um, to just sort of like get to the thing that you need to get to. And I want to share a story that kind of uh, shows a form of code switching. Um, one of the things that I do at 26 Letters, which is the company that I started, is um, asking employees to talk about what it's like to really work in the companies that they're in. One of the questions that we all ask all the time is, what is it like to be, you know, for me, a woman of color in the company X? Right, so what we're trying to do is create uh, a source of data that honestly answers that question, both pulling out the great things that people are doing as well as some of the challenges that companies are facing and how they're looking to address it. And we believe that sharing these stories is a learning opportunity for individuals, for companies, it's a learning opportunity for everyone. Um, and sometimes the stories are really great and fantastic, uh, like the one we heard earlier, um, you know, companies taking on requests and actually pushing forward and working to address some of the biases that they see. Sometimes the stories are a little bit difficult to hear. Um, so I'll share one that I think we've all sort of had a version of. So this woman in particular spoke about her experience and I have her permission to share the, her story anonymously. Um, she was doing really well at the company that she was in. She was receiving accolades for her work. So she was, you know, doing her own thing, really just kind of pushing forward. Um, but then things started to turn when she got a new manager. He asked her to address the softness of her voice. He thought that she spoke way too softly. Um, and in brace, brainstorming sessions, so a lot of the things that she did was just like come up with ideas and then create sort of, um, come up with ideas and sort of like push forward with those ideas. Um, and so he would ask her in brainstorming sessions in particular over and over again to prove that her ideas would work, which if you've been in a brainstorming session, it, the point is to like brainstorm, right? Um, <laughs> hence the name. Um, and so, and asked her, you know, was she going to track A, B, C, D, E, and F? And, and she was obviously not really prepared to answer those kinds of questions. He continued to grill her in front of her peers. And this is, you know, a room full of multiple, it's, it's not just her and him, it's multiple people. Um, and eventually she pulled him aside and asked why he kept pushing her for this stuff. And he said it's because, you know, this is how he saw people who were successful. Like this is what it meant to succeed under his management was to have this sort of very aggressive approach to things, to really push people to a breaking point to see where that was. And she told him that she didn't thrive in this kind of environment, um, but he kind of kept pushing, but because she loved her job, she loved where she worked, she complied. She deepened her voice in meetings. Um, she sat up straight in her chair. She shared detailed slide decks during these idea sessions, uh, and she switched her entire being to fit his idea of a good job or what this a per person in this position would be and should be. 
it pretty much ate her alive, as you can imagine. It's a lot of effort to kind of keep this persona up and going. Um, I don't know if many of you have tried to deepen your voice. As I tried this, I tried to really like, and it really took a lot out of me, just even in terms of my breath. Um, and so all the things that she was doing really ended up not being a great fit for her in particular. Um, and she ended up moving on to a new company where she could be more of herself. So stories like this, this is, this is one story, but I'm sure we all sort of have heard of a version of a story where people are having to switch their personalities in order to get something through, right? And there's a difference between, um, you know, presenting slides and sort of being prepared for something versus um, being in a brainstorm session and having to come in with everything that you have completely laid out and thought through. So what can companies do to um, to address some of this code switching that has a negative effect in the workplace. Uh, the first thing is to have a clear, um, an action-driven, well-resourced um, diversity, equity, and inclusion program. Please note that I put in there equity because a lot of times when we talk about diversity, culture, and inclusion, we definitely leave out the equity piece, which is incredibly important. And I, if you want to know more about that, please uh, reach out to me after this. There are a lot of great resources to help people with these programs and a lot of great individuals who do that amazing work to help companies do just that. Um, so again, that's around hiring, retaining, developing, all of that great stuff that keeps your people and your product happy. Number two is to bring in an outside view uh, for an assessment. A lot of companies think that they have the best culture. Uh, they that they effectively address issues that are faced by marginalized, but those who are marginalized in the sector. Um, and because of this, there's more of a pressure within the company to say that everything is okay. And an outside perspective means a fresh set of eyes uh, without people having to risk their jobs or their security in the workplace. There was a study that came out earlier this year that showed that non-white and women individuals who promote diversity and inclusion within their companies end up um, having a negative effect. So they're passed over for certain opportunities, things like that. So companies preach diversity all day long, but the truth is that when women, um, people who are traditionally marginalized in the sector, when they speak up and out about it, then they are faced, uh, they're forced to face the consequences of it. So I'm all for bringing out outside help because it helps um, mitigate, mitigate that. The next thing is to conduct a climate survey. Um, anonymous climate surveys by, again, outside agencies or outside individuals because of the stat that I said that I cited earlier. Um, I have been to so many different HR people who talk about how amazing and incredible their culture is, and I'm sure it is, but um, I'm always really wary of companies that don't highlight or don't know what their problem areas are, are right? No one is 100% perfect, so um, something to consider as if you ever interview for jobs or things like that, ask about sort of what are the challenges that they're facing and how are they addressing them? Um, and that's kind of where you'll see where the truth really lies from my perspective. And the next thing is to create um, nar narrative-based initiatives that foster community within your work environment. So um, specifically activities that allow individuals to learn more about each other, about their coworkers, and this will help build empathy and really enhance the human element in your day-to-day -day work. It is amazing the power of narratives. The power of storytelling is um, one of the most intuitive things that we have, which is why just even as human beings, it's sort of where we go first, is telling stories. Uh, and I have seen that just completely change um, work environments, teams, as you know each other, you know each other's strengths, you know each other's stories, you're far more empathetic to each other. And you stand up for each other a lot more. So there's an entire conversation to be had about how this applies specifically to product development and marketing efforts, but that's a different talk. Um, this is I view this as more of like a people talk, but something to keep in mind is um, when we talk about inclusion and culture um, and some of these specific things, uh, look at how they're affecting your marketing and your product development. So if your product is not um, accessible to people, if it's not accessible to different communities, then obviously that hinders your ability to produce really great work and it also keeps, um, it keeps a wall between you and other prospective candidates, prospective customers, stuff like that. 
Um, so like I mentioned before, code switching has become a necessary tool to adapting and surviving, but true inclusion is about elevation, and elevation breeds innovation. This is a space where individuals don't just survive, um, but they don't need to take time to make sure that, like for this woman's example, that her ideas fit into a well manded presentation styles that it looks and sounds just right. They express, they continue to innovate, and they continue to thrive. And as a result, companies, the company continues to thrive. So creating great workspaces means code switching isn't a mandatory survival tactic. It means that people's personal styles and sense of being can be in that space. It means that they can bring their best selves to work. Thank you. Any questions? Hi, um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on how you would suggest, I love the fact that you said you should be wary of a company when they're not clear on their own weaknesses or areas of growth. How you might actually bring that up, I guess in job interviews, a lot of times people feel they're like interviewing at the company and they're not as comfortable like actually interviewing the people that they are talking with. So how would you suggest um, voicing that question? Yeah, I would say if you're in a position where you can be a little bit pickier, always keep in mind that you're interviewing the company as much as they're interviewing you. And I definitely acknowledge that that comes from a spot of privilege to be able to say no to, a, to an organization that might want to hire you. Um, but one way is, and I found that actually a lot of a lot of individuals like when you ask them some of these questions, it forces them to think a little bit more. But um, one way to see that is just purely the space. Does the, spa does the space seem inclusive? Does it seem accessible? D is your interviewing panel sort of reflecting something that you would want to be around or, or a space that you would, and individuals that you would want to be around? But simply by asking, you know, how would you describe your culture? What are some of the challenges that you're, you're facing in terms of creating an inclusive culture and seeing what it is that they say back to you? So if the response is, oh, we have a great culture, like we really don't have anything that we worry about, um, that probably means that they also don't have like some kind of a program or initiative in place because the point of those is to highlight some of them. And if the answer is as simple as, well, we're working towards that and we, you know, within the next quarter we'll put together an initiative and then we're gonna be working off of that. So, you know, I don't have more details now, but I could in like a month or two. That's a much better answer than just, oh no, we're, everyone is happy. All people like working here. <laughs> Beware of that answer. Awesome, thank you.